Good morning, Coastlands Community Church. Please join us in worship. There is a light that burns in the darkness. There is a hope that washes the fear away. There is a peace that settles around us. Is your love that sets our hearts ablaze? Lord, 
in the
We wait for you. We wait for you. We wait for you. We wait for you. To walk in the room. We wait for you. We wait for you. We wait. walk in the room here we are here we are standing in your presence here we are standing in your presence kind of glory come down kind of glory come down here we are standing in your presence here we are standing in your presence Kind of glory comes down. Release the fullness. Release the fullness of your spirit. So kind of glory come. So kind of glory come. Release the fullness of your spirit. So kind of glory come. So kind of glory.
let us become more aware. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become Lord, may that be the cry of our heart. May that be our prayer today, Lord, that we would go in with your spirit on us, Lord, that we would go in your goodness, Lord, and that that would produce unity among your people, Lord. We ask that you would fill us fresh, God, that we would have boldness to walk out the plans that you've laid before us, Lord. Thank you for your presence. We thank you for bringing us here together today. And it's your name we pray. Amen. If I could have everyone that's going to summer camp, all of our kids, you can sit down while we do this. Kiddos, leaders that are going, worship leader that's going, everybody, come on down, come on, we're going to pray for all of our kids and teenagers and adults that are going to camp. They leave Saturday morning bright and early. Yeah, are you excited? All right. Is it anybody's, oh, I know. Is it anybody's first time to go to camp? We have a first time summer camper right there. Woohoo! Oh, yeah. <laughs> summer camp is really important, and in the larger um, Four Square family, it has always been a great place to encounter God for our young people and our older people. And we're excited about this group of young people that are going to spend time away and separate, away from um, distractions and technology with the purpose of. Um, Hearing from the Lord, growing in Him, and building relationships with one another. So let's pray for these guys. Would you join me? Lord, we thank you for each and every person here. We thank you for for the youngest to the oldest that are going, Lord. Some are going to serve and work hard, and some are going to enjoy fun and games and your presence. God, I pray that everyone would be touched by you and that this would be a moment in their life where they lay a marker to remember the things that you did in their life, Lord, that it would be significant and deep work that's done in them, Father. Pray that you would... Provide strength for the leaders that are going. Pray that you would protect them, Lord, that you would keep them safe, that there wouldn't be sickness and injury, Father. Keep them safe as they travel, that they would be able to come back and give us great God stories of how you were working in their life during this week away. In your name we pray. 
Amen. All right, kiddos, you can be dismissed to Kids Church. If you're a guest with with us today, uh, we have a guest card right in the seat back, and we would love for you to fill that out so that we could connect with you. If you have a prayer request, you can also fill that out and drop it in the offering box here or in the back, um, and then we will pass it on to our prayer team. If you're my in-laws, you do not have to fill out a guest card. I already have your information. (laughs) So at this time, we're going to do our tithes and offerings. If you're a regular attender, you know the drill. If you're our guest, we bring our tithes and offerings right here to the basket. Or you can always give online. Or now we have text to give, which has a phone number on the slide that David will put up. Go for it. We have a couple of announcements. In August, we have a couple of uh, events that fall under our intentional summer connections. We're going to Symphony by the Sea on August 8th, and you can go online and get details about that. Thank you, Bob. Uh, as well as potluck after lunch. Both of those things are on the website and in your bulletin, so please read your bulletin to get those details. Um, and we suggest arriving early for Symphony by the Sea because it fills up fast and you need to bring your own seating. And Pastor Sherry will be leading that and putting a group together, so if you want to let her know, she'll save you a spot. All right. Hopefully I didn't forget anything. Well, this week we are continuing our series, uh, Intentional Unity. And we've been, Bruce kind of kicked us off with this, to this transition when he gave his testimony and shared particularly about forgiveness, um, but his testimony is an amazing, um, a testament to what God does in someone's heart around the issue of race relations. So I'm so thankful that he got to share some of that with you because I was, in thinking about his story, it matters that... Bruce was healed around what he was taught about race relations. He served as uh, in the fire department and as a peace officer for over 30 years. And I was just um, thinking on that this morning. It would matter if he had not come to encounter the Lord and believe that all people were made in the image of God. Can you imagine how many people he's had? To, he has come in contact 
within his career that he would have treated differently if he had not had that truth revealed and healed in his heart. And I was thankful that he mentioned EHS because that's going to come up a lot uh, for us today. And I just wanted to touch on that because it, it really matters for each one of us to really, really grasp the importance of walking out in the unity that the Lord has and believing that everyone's made in his image. Um, after Bruce shared, Pastor Durant talked about uh, freedom, or July 4th weekend, and that Christ died for all, focusing on that scripture in Galatians that says uh, that it was for everybody, just to be clear. And then last week he talked about uh, the image of God, and that God said, let, him make, let us make him in our likeness. So we are all somehow like Christ. Uh, today I get to continue it with... Um, the Ministry of Reconciliation. So I would like to start us off in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If you're following along in our reading plan this month, this was the scripture from yesterday. And I am going to pull lots of scriptures today from what we've been reading and what we're going to continue to read. I don't know if you can see that from that far away, but I'm going to read it for us. I'm reading from the God's Word translation. Which says, so from now on, we don't think of anyone from a human point of view. If we did think of Christ from a human point of view, we don't anymore. Whoever is a believer in Christ is a new creation. The old way of living has disappeared. A new way of living has come into existence. Verse 18, God has done all this. He has restored our relationship with him through Christ and has given us this ministry of restoring relationships. In other words, God was using Christ to restore his relationship with humanity. He didn't hold people's faults against them. What did he do? He didn't hold people's faults against them. And he has given us this message of restoring, of restored relationships to tell others. Therefore, we are Christ's representatives. And through us, God is calling you. And we beg you on behalf of Christ to become reunited with God. God had Christ, who was sinless, take our sin so that we might receive God's approval through him. 2 Corinthians 5, 8, 16, all the way through verse 21. When you look up reconcile, just in the dictionary, it means to bring into agreement or harmony, to make compatible or consistent. When you look up the word ministry, it says something that, something that serves as an agent or an agency, an instrument or means. So this restoring relationships is the part we're going to focus on. And then in the next verse, in 19, where it says this message of restored relationships. When you look this word up in the Hebrew, it's diakonia. That's that's how Google pronounced it, diakonia. Which means ministering, service, especially those who execute the command of others. And in this text, Paul is encouraging us to respond to God's work in obedience to Christ, to be reconcilers, to go in the service of reconciling, to be an instrument who brings into agreement. Doesn't that go along with unity? We want to bring into agreement people, our relationships into agreement with what God's word says. And then the the next scripture in verse 19, it said he has given us this message of restored relationships. And there the word is catalogue, and it means an adjustment of difference, restoration to favor, and in exchange. So it's an embodiment. We are to embody adjustments of differences. That doesn't sound like one or the other is right. We're supposed to adjust for these differences. The Lord has this unity, this restoring of relationships, and this message that we are supposed to take. But before you can plow forward in this going, this doing of good, there's a few things that must come first. You can't Ask someone to be reconciled to one another into something that you yourself have not been reconciled to and are not practicing. It doesn't make any sense. So what are we trying to repair? What are we trying to redo? So I want us to back up from going in that reconciliation for a minute to talk about the steps that are necessary so that we're ready. Um, and they're not necessarily linear steps. It's not A, B, C in order all the time. In Co- at Coastlands, we believe in the journey and in the seat. Back in the chair in front of you, we've got a little pamphlet, and we talk about the spiritual journey a lot. And we're at various places, every one of us, in our own reconciliation to to ourselves, to the Lord, and then going in our message of reconciliation. Um, So again, they're not in any order today, because Jesus draws people 
to himself and on his timing and in his various ways. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So there are two questions that we're going to talk about for a minute, and that is, are you reconciled to yourself, and are you reconciled to God? And this quote right here by John Calvin says, Our wisdom consists entirely of two parts, the knowledge of God and of ourselves, but these are connected together by many ties. It's not easy to determine which of the two proceeds and gives birth to the other. So first, I'm going to talk about being reconciled to yourself. In, uh, next slide, please. In EHR, we have the, that image in our textbook, An Emotionally Healthy Relationships, and it talks about our family commandments. And number eight on that Ten Commandments of what our family of origin taught us, it says our attitudes about other ethnicities and cultures. So to be reconciled to yourself, you have to know what you actually believe. And sometimes that's uncomfortable because some of us were taught very um, anti-biblical beliefs about other ethnicities and cultures. We were taught things out of fear or uh, culture, sin, just just wrong things. And before we can really uh, align with the right things, we kind of got to acknowledge what the wrong things are. So we do that a lot in emotionally healthy spirituality and emotionally healthy relationships. And so... You've got to do that. Before you can really go in reconciliation, you've got to know what you believe. You've got to know who you are. Um, A lot of us in the room may not know our, we may identify just as white and may not be aware of what our ethnicities are. And that's something that we miss in America where everything is just uh, white as it has been socially constructed. So I'm going to challenge you, if you're looking to grow in this area, find out what makes up who you are. Go to Ancestry.com. Find some genealogy information. Do a a DNA test. My family discovered we didn't have as much Indian in us as we thought we did. Or my dad thought we did. Um, and, and, And look at your life story. You've had experiences that have come to help you believe what you do believe for the negative or the positive surrounding other cultures and ethnicities. Um... To be reconciled to yourself, you need to be self-aware. And um, one of those things is look at what what scripture do you, do you cling to? A.W. Telzer says, what comes to our minds when we think about God is one of the most important things about us. So what is your personality? Are you a learner? Are you a warrior? What are you bringing to the table in this on this topic of unity and reconciliation? Be aware of it. Um, Bruce mentioned how EHS help him become more aware of it. And then the things that um, just, things that get buried just get buried. They don't go away. There's always still affecting us. And so there's nothing wrong with acknowledging it, even when those things are hard. And sometimes feel dishonoring. Sometimes it's hard to admit what our parents may have taught us around other cultures that don't align with the Bible. But it's not dishonoring to acknowledge it and make a change in that. Um, in emotionally healthy activism, they talk about, they, they will show images that are often in the news that are um, maybe shocking or they have a lot of um, press around them, a lot of negative uh, feelings. And so when, they, when we go through EHA, which we haven't done here yet, they ask you to just name it. Name your reaction. Name your feeling. Okay? Because all of us have a reaction and we have feelings when we, say, we see cultures fighting, when we see violence, when we see racial um, stories in the news. And to just acknowledge that. Just to yourself. You don't even have to take it to anybody else. Just acknowledge. Does that make you feel scared, hurt, ashamed when you see uh, people treating one another so poorly? We can't ask someone to be reconciled to what we don't know what we're asking them to be reconciled to. So the first challenge for you today is to be reconciled with yourself. And if there are things in you that don't align with the word of God around race and other cultures... Dig into the Word of God and see how you can, first of all, be an agent for reconciliation for yourself. Next, next slide there is a quote from Augustine, and he says, Grant, Lord, that I may know myself, that I may know thee. So next we're going to talk about being reconciled to God. You can be doing all kinds of kind, good work, but what you're doing will only be temporary if, if it is not done out of obedience to God through the power of the Holy Spirit. So we are not just simply talking about doing good works, or things that are labeled social justice, though I am all for social justice things. If they are not done with the power of the Holy Spirit, they become temporary. And I don't know about you, but if you're a Christ follower, I'm hoping that the things that I invest in and give my life to are eternal things and not temporary things. So, uh, here today, 
if there's anyone in the room that's not accepted Jesus as their Savior, we have pastors that are available afterwards if you would like help starting that journey. There are cards and seat back again that you can see where you are, and we would love to have a conversation if that's where you are. But when Jesus enters your life, when the gospel becomes important to you, it changes how you go. You go differently when you're walking in obedience to the Holy Spirit and out of the love that Jesus uh, exemplifies. So in verse 20 of this text here in 2 Corinthians 5.20, it says, verse 20, it says, Therefore, we are Christ's representatives, and through us God is calling you. We beg you on behalf of Christ to become reunited with God. When we are united or reunited with God, the natural outflow of that is that we become a restorer of relationships. That's the first thing he did in dying on the cross is restored a relationship with us. And that is the first step for us is to go and be a restorer of relationships. We become his reps and his agents that should be following his pattern. So, if you're ready to go, if you can say, I know why I believe what I believe... I'm following Christ, and I'm ready to be an agent of his towards intentional unity, towards being a messenger of reconciliation. You can say, I've done the work. Then you're ready to go. So, next slide, please. But before you go forward in this, we got to take a step back again. Like in EHS, it always says, go back to go forward. We have to... Not be Pollyannish about what we're talking about today. Uh, We don't want to be ignorant. We want to be educated about the culture that we live in. And so sometimes that means reading a different book. Pastor Durant has a couple of his favorites and recommendations that are for sale back there that will challenge us and how we see other cultures. Um, But, for example, some of the history that's often uh, overlooked, now that I live in Virginia, I have learned a few uh, stories about Virginia history, so I'm going to focus on those today. This is a photo of the Norfolk 17, which are 17 students that integrated Norview High School in the 50s, and teachers wore gloves so that they wouldn't have to touch them. Yeah. Yeah. And I did not ever read that in my history book. I know every detail can't be covered, but teachers in the 50s at Norview High School, right up that way, I think, (laughs) wore gloves so they did not have to touch black students. They were severely, severely mistreated. Those people, I I believe almost, I think all of them are still alive because they were in the news because this was the um, 60th anniversary this last February of when they basically forced their way into the school because the Norfolk did not want to integrate, and the federal government was forcing them to. So those 17 young people endured gross abuse and racism at the hands of the white school. Uh, A couple other little snippets. I learned recently that in the, uh, it was 1933, the story I was reading, black defendants who were accused of a crime, who were being held in jail until their trial, were often kidnapped from the jail and lynched. How how does someone get kidnapped from a jail? Right? How does someone get kidnapped from a jail? But that's what would happen. And we uh, we, we have a certain image of the sort of people who did that. But when you read the stories, mob lynchings took place all the time in Virginia while women and children were there. So this isn't just like a hooded monsters off in the field. Like this is what they did and somehow thought it was okay. And this was like a couple of generations back. Like my grandfather was born when this stuff was happening. So that means my great-grandparents were the sort of the generation that was doing this stuff. Their their people, their culture, this was normal in the Deep South. In a trip through the Deep South in the 1930s, Thurgood Marshall observed terrible conditions at an all-black school, and he found an empty white school nearby and talked to the school authorities, and they would not let the school be used for black children. That was what the culture was like. Uh, Not to mention that they were scared for their life the whole time they traveled through the Deep South because they were staring up trouble by investigating it. If you go to the next slide, this one uh, is pretty well known because they cover it at the Civil Rights Museum. This is called the Little Rock Nine. In 1947, they were, the government forced uh, Arkansas to integrate. So 
most of you are probably familiar with the 1954 Brown versus the Board of Education ruling that schools had to desegregate. But most states were fighting that. So here we are three years later, and they have not obeyed desegregation. So uh, the president was forcing them to let the students come to school. So they've got the, the NAACP has these nine students that have met the new requirements that were enacted uh, to uh, sort of fly under the radar to not integrate. Okay, so they said, okay, yes, we'll integrate, but this school takes these kind of people. So they have to make this test score, they have to be able to do this, et cetera, et cetera. It became, became a new way to not desegregate. So they found nine students that met all the requirements, so there was no way they could justify keeping them out of school. And then the they had to bring in the uh, National Guard to because they anticipated such rioting and chaos at the school. The governor of Arkansas brought in the troops. He was not for the desegregation. He really brought them in because he wanted to protect the school, not the students integrating the school. Well, when that happened, then the president military federalized those same people and told them they had to protect the black students. So in the end, there were like t over 10,000 National Guard and Army people in Little Rock, Arkansas in 1957 to help integrate a high school. Like, okay, how many of you were alive in 1954? Okay, a few of you. How many of you in the room's parents were alive in 1954? Okay, and then grandparents. Right, okay. This was not that long ago that we were having to bring 10,000 troops to Little Rock, Arkansas so that nine kids could safely go to school. And safely is a loose term because once they were in, they were still terribly, terribly mistreated. And some of them are alive and still tell those stories. Um, and some of those resources are available in the email that you'll receive during service today. So not that we, not that we live in the past or go back, but this stuff gets forgotten so easily when we talk about race relations today because we say, well, like, I'm not racist. I don't do this, right? But my grandparents were the people when this was happening. Like, they were young adults when this stuff was happening, and it was, it was normal, and people were not all standing against it. Um, I'd like to read, go to the next slide real quick, the description, just to emphasize how drastic this was. We are a military town. There's lots of military in the room. You may be very familiar with what the 101st Airborne Division is. I was not, so I looked it up. It is a special modular light infantry division of the U.S. Army trained for their air assault operations. The Screaming Eagles has been referred to as the tip of the spear by the U.S. Secretary of Defense and the most potent and tactically mobile of the U.S. Army's division by a former Army general. The 101st Airborne is able to plan, coordinate, and execute, execute brigade air assault operations capable of seizing key terrain in support of operational objectives. And on and on. These popular operations are conducted by highly mobile teams covering extensive distances and engaging enemy forces behind en enemy lines. Why in 1957 in Little Rock, Arkansas, did we need that drastic of a force to come? Because the current culture was completely against those students integrating. The culture was still equal but separate. They're okay as long as they stay in their school and on their side of the tracks and in their stores and in their places. Does that sound like we're honoring the image of God in those people? I mean, no, and it's just, it's unbelievable that it took that much. I was listening to an interview the other day on a podcast, and it was a white senator from the South during the 50s, and he was talking about how we'll do whatever it takes to keep our schools separate, even if it means loss of life. So they were willing to have loss of life, and he wasn't just referring to the military. He meant whatever it takes to keep our schools separate. We have to acknowledge this past to help really be agents of reconciliation, right? So when someone really, really, really hurts you and they come back and they say, oh, I'm sorry, you know, let's just move on. Doesn't really, doesn't really work very well, does it? Like, really? When they just want to gloss it over and go forward, we have to acknowledge like, how bad these woundings were in the places where we live and how we were complicit, even if we weren't racist on our own. 
All right, so one more. This one I learned a year or two ago, and it's uh, here in Prince Edward County. There's not a slide for this one. In 1959, so the school, school board said integrate in 54. Virginia fought it for five more years. And when they were going to be forced to integrate the elementary schools out in Prince Edward County, Virginia, they just said, forget it, we're closing the schools. If the black kids are going to come over here, nobody goes to school. So for the better part of five years, kids went without school. White kids and black kids. Now, some of the white kids had enough resources available to them to get vouchers to go to other schools and could continue their education, but most black students went without education for five years between 1959 and 64. How many of you were alive in 1964? That was not that long ago. My, my, my dad was in school by this point. All right, so it's important that we go back, and that's why I shared some of those little startling history facts with us, because we want to go forward, but sometimes this requires the acknowledgement, some lament and forgiveness before we can change and really go forward in being agents of reconciliation. We need to go in humility, and knowing some of these things brings that humility to us. Because the people that experience this are still alive, and they've raised children in light of how they were treated when they were a child, who are now raising children and grandchildren that experience this. And this is not an easy thing to get over. I'm, I'm certain that it's, it's still affecting those the same way that our family choices and situations are affecting us. Okay, so this is uh, systemic racism. This is not what the kingdom of God looks like. And we, we must acknowledge for them what's been passed down and for us what's been passed down so that we can move forward really well. White supremacy is the offspring of the dark powers of this world. There is no place in God's kingdom for white supremacy, period. But these things that we've just gone over are like, you know, in EHR, if you've taken EHR, we have a genogram. And we acknowledge some of the unhealthy patterns or sin and, or wrong things that have happened generationally in our families. So that we can put a stop to those and make a change and stop reacting out of those and go forward in a new direction. These, these things that we, I've just rattled off today are our national genogram. These are the things that have been passed down in our culture. And we have to acknowledge them because they have to be, they have to be stopped. The kingdom of God does not look like white supremacy. There is no room for it in our church. The next slide says, uh, it's a quote by Brennan Manning, and it says, What is denied cannot be healed. And that is the importance of not forgetting the recent history for our, our state, basically. All right, turn with me to Matthew chapter five, uh, 25. We read this earlier this week. Beginning in verse 34 through 36. Matthew 25, 34 through 36, and then I'll read verse 40 also. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, my father has blessed you. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me into your home. I needed clothes, and you gave me something to wear. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Verse 40. The king will answer them, I can guarantee you this truth. Whatever you did for one of my brothers or sisters, no matter how unimportant they seemed, you did it for me. Now use a little prophetic imagination with me here. If this scripture was written in Virginia in the 1950s, might Jesus have also said, you let me into your schools? See, we, we cut this off because those things fit because it doesn't go on and say that but if that's what was in our culture at the time might Jesus have asked us you did it for me when you let me into your school and then a few verses later he says that they are sent away to eternal punishment how we behave to those who seem the least important in our culture matters to God so I want to challenge you today to become ministers of reconciliation like I said earlier an instrument who brings people into agreement, one who embodies the adjusting of those differences. We are different. I'm not advocating that we're all this, we should all be the same or that this won't be difficult. Uh, Pastor Durant office often references blundering through it with Tony. Um, I have been blessed as well to blunder through some things with Tony and be able to have really uh, great 
honest EHR conversations. And I am so thankful for Tony's presence in my life as a friend to help me um, grow in this area. I'm going to use a term, Durant said I could, because I know activist isn't everybody's favorite word, and he said I could talk about it. An activist, I heard uh, this term, this definition recently by Lisa Sharon Harper, and she is a black woman theologian that I am really enjoying learning from and reading her books right now. And she said on an interview, when she was asked what an activist is on the fly, she said, someone whose body is moved by the Holy Spirit to stand against the powers of this world that would try to crush the image of God in others. I read it again. Someone whose body is moved by the Holy Spirit to stand against the powers of this world that would try to crush the image of God in others. So why am I asking you to be an activist or an advocate? Because there has to be some loud white voices too. Because when you read the history, when you listen to the interviews, when you listen to uh, the politicians of the time, the school leaders, they were loud white voices who were crushing the image of God in black Americans at the time. And so personally for me, that's why I'm passionate about it. I want to be one of the people who fit the exact uh, demographic class status of the people that were so against it two generations ago. I want to stand in defiance of that way of doing life and say I will be a loud voice that is advocating for reconciliation and not crushing the image of God in any person based on their skin color or social status or standing. I don't see any racism in the kingdom of God. David, would you go to the next slide, please? We're going to go through these scriptures. I believe all of these were actually in our reading plan this last week. So if you want to turn to Galatians 3, or if you're a total hipster and you have your uh, Bible on your phone, Mark this one. Galatians 3, verse 22 through 29. But scripture states that the whole world is controlled by the power of sin. Therefore, a promise based on faith in Christ Jesus could be given to those who believe. We are kept under, the, under control by Moses' law until this faith came. We are under their control until this faith came until this faith which was about to come would be revealed. Before Christ came, Moses' law served as our guardian. Christ came so that we could receive God's approval by faith. But now this faith has come, and we are no longer under control of a guardian. We are all God's children by believing in Christ Jesus. Clearly, all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There are neither Jews nor Greeks, slave nor free, male nor female. You are all the same in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, you are Abraham's descendants. No mention of anything that separates us. All right. Revelation 7. This is one that most people are familiar with. Starting in verse 9, it says, After these things I saw a large crowd from every nation, tribe, language, and people. I won't go into details, but the reason there are four different words there, they are four different words in the original language, and they mean a little bit different than we uh, think about today but they cover they cover everything there are there were people from every nation tribe language and no one was able to count how many there were they were standing in front of the throne of the lamb they were wearing white white robes holding palm branches in their hands and crying out in a loud voice salvation belongs to our god who sits on the throne and to the lamb all the angels stood around the throne with the leaders And the four living creatures, they bowed in front of the throne with their faces touching the ground and worshipped God. That's what the kingdom of heaven is going to look like. If you struggle with it now, you're going to be in a big shock for it later. Because we are going to fall on our face and worship God with people from every nation, tribe, and tongue, language, everything. Everyone will be there because they came from the same place we did. Made in the likeness of God. All right, Zechariah 7, beginning in verse 8. If you spent much time around me recently, you've already, several of you have already heard me read this passage of Scripture. 
Then the Lord said, spoke this word to Zechariah. He said, this is what the Lord of armies says. Administer real justice and be compassionate and kind to each other. Don't oppress widows, orphans, foreigners, and poor people. And don't even think of doing evil to each other. But people refuse to pay attention. They shrugged their shoulders at me and shut their ears so that they couldn't hear. They made their hearts as hard as flint so that they couldn't hear the Lord's teachings. The words that the Lord of Army had sent by his spirit through the earlier prophets. So the Lord of Army, the Lord of Armies became very angry. How we treat people, closing our ears to the Lord makes him very angry. When I called, they would not listen. So when I when they call, I won't listen, says the Lord of Armies. I used a windstorm to scatter them among all the nations. They hadn't even heard of the nations. They left behind a land so ruined, no one is able to travel through it. They have turned a pleasant land into a wasteland. Speaks for itself. Back to... The text in Matthew, Matthew 25, verse 40. verse 40 says the king will answer them I can guarantee you this truth whatever you did for one of my brothers and sisters no matter how important they seemed you did it for me there is always someone in our culture that is being made to be unimportant it changes depending on where you live what country you're in what city you're in uh, what your neighborhood is like what culture values at the time it, it's always going to change, but the scripture does not. Jesus cares about whoever seems least important. In this moment in culture, we still have a tendency uh, to dehumanize to other people, to make them something less than a brother and sister in Christ or someone made in the image of God. At the end of Matthew, we're challenged to go and make disciples. We are Jesus left us with this message to go and make disciples. We are to be messengers that are asking people to reconcile themselves to God. We can't reconcile, we can't help people reconcile to God when we can't even reconcile among ourselves. When we treat, when we dehumanize, when we crush the image of God and other people, what are we asking people to be reconciled to? It doesn't work. People, the, the culture sees that and thinks, well, I don't want a part of that either. And we're, we, we lose when we don't go in unity. We lose when we don't carry that message of reconciliation. When we don't embody moving ourselves to be reconcilers. We pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Well, the kingdom is diverse. And really, we call it diverse. The Lord didn't call it diverse. <laughs> the Lord called it made in our own likeness in Genesis. When we encounter the gospel, it, it asks us to change. Repent actually means to change the way you think and act. When you become a Christ follower, things must change. And in the application to culture and ethnicity, we've got to stop. We have to stop othering. We have to recognize in our own selves when we are dehumanizing. Every one of us has some things that we justify um, not liking or othering or mistreating it, it's in us we, we are all sinners we all have those things um, the email that will come out today has a link again but if you haven't taken the implicit bias test that's been um, in the emails these last few weeks I challenge you to take it and if you want to see other things that you might have a bias about there's a lot of them but just the black white implicit bias test can be very eye-opening to people especially those that maybe think they've been working on this or they would say I'm not racist because we in America have constructed racist to mean malicious actions okay I have never in my life done an, a malicious act towards someone of any color really but particularly not that qualifies as racist I have not done something to them so I would have told you I am I am not racist I, I, I didn't grow up that way. Okay, well, I also grew up in the country where there were actually no black people around. My church had um, Miss Laureen, which is, she was eternally like 85 years old my whole life. She's still alive, I think. So, But she was always just the oldest lady in the church. Another little old lady that held the door every Sunday and hugged everybody, Miss Martha. 
And occasionally, her adult children and grandchildren would visit. And when I was a kid, that was um, about the extent of my regular in, um, engagement with anyone that was black. I was homeschooled, so that, that limited it as well. Our schools were still very white where I grew up. Um, and so I didn't, uh, I didn't have a bad experience with black people. I didn't have any experience. Uh, I knew the side of town they lived on. Uh, my mom's a pretty bold person, so we drove down that street because it was the quickest route into town. Um, other people avoided it. I was aware of those little nuanced things, but I didn't. I was a racist. And then I read that thing, that definition, and I thought that's what so many people do to say, I'm not, I'm not racist. I've never done something mean because someone was black or another race. But there, there's more to it. We have these implicit biases that come when um, you lock your doors when the homeless guy's black instead of white. Um, when, you, when, you, when you do those things instinctively and you, you step back and go, why did I do that? I, I did that because he was black. I wasn't really, if he was white, I wouldn't have thought about it at all. When you become aware of those things, you start to see, it's based, it's based on a lie, it's based on fear. When you look at you know, demographics and statistics and who commits crimes and where you live, all that stuff. There's just as much, many, you know, people of all different colors and races doing things. But we operate in fear because we've been given a narrative, often in, in media, that black people are bad. And those things are transferred, even though my parents would have said, we're not racist, black people aren't bad. There were still certain things that were passed on that I have to ask myself, am I operating out of fear? Am I operating out of the word of God? Why did I do that? Just acknowledging it for yourself. Why did I do that? It's perfectly fine to lock the door. I Actually, my car, as soon as I put it in drive, it locks, so it's convenient. But when we do those things just because someone was black, it tells us something about ourselves. And that, that awareness will start to say, hmm, I wonder, I wonder why I did that. Um, we didn't have a washer um, for a couple of months when we first moved into our house, or I think maybe it just broke is what it was. Um, Durant had found me a set, per the usual, on the curb and had fixed them up, and they were getting by, and they quit working, and I was going to the laundromat for a while, um, which I actually enjoyed because it forced me into my community a couple hours every every week. And I met a man, and he his name was Dennis. And Dennis was, was working at the laundromat. He'd sweep the floors and clean and ask for some change. And we'd, we'd chat, and I'd see him pretty regularly. Well, he walks around in the neighborhood where I live, and uh, he, he claims to be homeless, though some neighbors have told me he's not. He's clearly mentally uh, handicapped or maybe some drug use there. Lives a few streets back. One of the other neighbors told me, don't, don't talk to him. I said, okay. Uh, so... Uh, so far, in the two years, we, we got our house in August. So far in two years, I've been able to manage to keep my um, uh, fact that I'm not scared of stuff like that, and I go for it, and I don't care if he knows where I live, and when he comes by and wants some yard work, we try to help him out, and I feed him. Um, I've never invited him in, um, but we always go out on the porch and uh, feed and talk to him and when help him when we can. All right, so... That is not what people are comfortable with, okay? I'm comfortable with Dennis. I am not scared of Dennis. Um, he is a very frail little old man. I'm pretty sure I could probably take Dennis if it need be. But, but, but people are. And I'm not kidding you. I've had him stop by my house before, a few hours before one of my friend's young kids were going to be there. And I was like, oh, I'm so glad he came by before her kids were here. I, wouldn't, I don't want this, this homeless guy to stop by when I've got, I'm babysitting my friend's little kids because it doesn't fit with everyone. For me, I'm fine with it. My husband's fine with it. Weston's getting fine with it. He's learning to not be scared of people that look a little scary. Um, but that true story, that's how, that's how it is. And it's happened a few times where I'm like, okay, if they could just not happen where it would make people really uncomfortable when they're at my house, that'd be better. Okay, I'm kind of non-confrontational. Well, my in-laws are in town. And guess who knocks on the door? As soon as they knocks on the door yesterday, I look at Buddy, and I'm like, Dennis is here. <laughs> so they got to a little taste of uh, how I actually live. Uh I don't know Dennis' story. I don't know if Dennis wants to take the 50 cents in change to go buy drugs. But talking to Dennis and feeding him a sandwich on my front porch changed for our family how we see people that are struggling with drug addiction, homelessness, 
being othered, um, it changes us when we, we we serve the least of these. I had a conversation with Weston about it recently because we visited our neighbor all the time, and she passed away a couple of weeks ago. And I, I was just pondering whether it mattered that we gave this little old lady rides to the bank uh, and to the beer store and some things like that. I was like, can this can this can this be Jesus? Am I being Jesus? Am I, am I being good to my neighbor? And I was reminded of this scripture that whatever you did to the least of these. This was a little old lady that lived next door that was where she was who was there. She's who needed love and she's who needed uh, to be cared for. And so it mattered because Jesus said, whoever is the least important, it matters. So uh, let's talk about some practical steps to help move us forward. All right, so you got to get out of your bubble. All right, so when I moved to Virginia, I got out of my bubble. I always had this desire, this inkling to live somewhere where my neighbors needed me. And I really wanted to have this sort of social experiment of living um, in a more diverse or black neighborhood. So when we bought our house over in P-Town, as I hear people call it, Portsmouth, we were, we were warned because that was the ghetto, and you're moving across the tunnel, and do you feel safe there? And, oh, you live in Cavalier, ooh, you know, okay, so I'm like, I guess we hit the right spot, babe. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not, I obviously said, I'm not sure if we can have your parents or my dad come to visit, but I love where I get to live. I love being the white lady that's talking to the cashier and that's, that's uh, engaging that's changing the narrative on my little street because I just, I I go for it. I know my neighbors, I take them cookies, I talk to them. I'm going for it. So you got to get out of your bubble. And that may not mean moving there. I know there are factors. We homeschool, so it doesn't matter our school district. There were not certain concerns about choosing a neighborhood that other people have that are valid. But I, I got to do it. So for our time in Virginia, I am living this on purpose. But a few weeks ago when my neighbor died, I went to her funeral. I drove out to Emporia where they have a family plot and they were going to bury her there. I was the only white person in the room. Um, and I got a little taste of what it might be sometimes when you're the only white person in the room or when you're the only black person in the room and white culture is something everyone else gets because I didn't get, I didn't really know what was going on. I've been to lots of funerals, so I know how to act and wait. And, and, uh, but it was very different. And I was like, I wonder what, if this is what it's like when there's a predominant culture and it's something you're completely not used to. The way they did their funeral was nothing like any of the funerals that I had previously attended. And so I was thankful for the opportunity to see another perspective and think, hmm, I wonder if this is what people feel like when they go into the room and they're the only one like them. So I challenge you to find some ways to get outside of your bubble. Uh, get out of your echo chamber. Read a book. Read something by somebody of another race that's got a little bit different experience. Hear how they see the text because of their family history. You know, it's very interesting to hear an older black person read scripture differently because of their connection to oppression and slavery that I'm completely unaware of. I have not experienced anything like that in my life. They see the scripture differently. They encounter the Lord differently. And it's really good to learn from people like that. Humble yourself. Don't be arrogant. It's, it's, not, a good, it's not a good plan. Uh, humility. Humility. Pride comes before a fall. So go in humility. Ask questions, but ask them genuine and in humility. And then this, I'm going to read a scripture, Acts 11:17. Uh, says, when they believed, God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. So who was I to interfere with God? And Paul's talking about when the Holy Spirit came. I'm not going to be Pollyannish and think there's never going to be an us and a them. There's always going to be some way that we're, we're us and theming in different groups of people. It's just kind of human nature. We're we're tribal instinctively. But in the kingdom of God, we're purposely working towards reconciling. Who am I to interfere with God? I challenge you to pray that. When you realize that there's a lot of us and them in your world, ask God to help you see it differently. Ask, Ask him, who am I to interfere with God? God had a plan, and it looks, in the end, it looks like Revelation 7, 9. Every tribe, every nation, every tongue, together worshiping him. That's, that's how this ends. I'm not advocating for colorblind because I know there will always be some us and them and different colors and different, different kinds of people. But I'm asking you to like get past it, to get over it. If those things are bothering you and you're letting them stand between relationships and you're letting 
uh, creating a box to keep people out, you need to get past it. And I'm asking you to do that. In Wide Awake, one of the books that Pastor Durant recommended, it's got some markers that he uses as a, a proof of progress, he kind of calls them, to see if you're making, chain, uh, making steps in this journey of color towards uh, being aware of whiteness. Because often, it's the dominant culture. We're not aware of what's considered white or what things we do that are white culture because it is the predominant culture. And so one of the proof of progress is he says, you are no longer defensive about white supremacy. And if that's where you are today and you're still defensive when you hear uh, stories of white supremacy or things that are still done in the name of white supremacy today, I would ask you to go back to where we started today and work on reconciliation with yourself and God. Because there, there may be things in your family or your experiences with other cultures, your, your trauma that might have produced that belief in you, but God didn't. There is no white supremacy in the kingdom of God. And whiteness is not the price of admission to heaven. And so if that's where you are and you're still struggling with that being defensive, you're probably not ready to go yet. We need to go back to go forward and lay those things at the feet of Jesus and, and acknowledge that, that those things done to crush the image of God and other people are just wrong. All right. Uh, go ahead, David. Go to the next slide. Did I miss one yet? Okay, yeah, I'm going to read this to you. Uh, This is uh, an interpretation of the same scripture in Matthew 25. And it says, because of this decision, we don't evaluate people by what they have or how they look. We looked at the Messiah that way once, and we all got it wrong, as you know. We certainly don't look at him that way anymore. Now we look inside. And what we see is that anyone united with the Messiah gets a fresh start. He is new. The old life is gone. A new life begins. Look at it. All this comes from God who settled the relationship between us and him. Then called us to settle our relationships with each other. God put the world square with himself through the Messiah, giving the world a fresh offering A fresh start by offering forgiveness of sin. God has given us the task of telling everyone what he is doing. We are Christ's representatives. God uses us to persuade men and women to drop their differences and enter into God's work of making things right between them. We are speaking for Christ himself now. Become friends with God. He is already a friend with you. How, you ask? In Christ. God put the wrong on him who never did anything wrong so that we could be put right with God. So if you need help, ask. Ask a friend. Ask Pastor Durant. Come talk to me. Tony, we have some. We have undivided conversation here at our church. It's a very safe place to learn and grow and ask questions that sometimes sound ignorant to others. It's been... Um, it's been great to see that develop in our church for the last year. Um, occasionally, I will lead a secret book club that will go through some controversial stuff, but I try to keep it small and make sure we've been through EHS so that we can process really well because I don't like debate and controversy, so I like to keep it a small, uh, kind group as we do that. But I love this topic, so if you need help with this, let's talk about it. And ask the Holy Spirit. Ask Him to heal the hurts, the injuries, or the sins that were done to you or that you did to others around race relations. Ask Um, Read a book. Durant's got a stack out there that are for sale. The God in Scripture, we hear him referred to a father who cares about us and compared to a mother who loves us. So I can can only imagine how his heart hurts because those Scriptures depict him as good parents. When parents' children hurt each other, when they are trying to destroy each other, it must hurt God's heart. I I only have one child, so I don't know how this works, but I can't imagine the hurt at a mother's heart or a father's heart when the kids hate each other, won't be in the same room with each other, just want to tell you what's bad about each other. I can imagine that's that's a pretty hard place to be. And some of you may have family relationships that are like that. It is not supposed to be that way in the kingdom of God. And we are not certainly not supposed to create those things around race relationships. And at the end of the day, at the end of our lives, and at the end of the world, we're going to come together as his children in worship. It is thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And it looks a lot more diverse than sometimes we've imagined. Certainly more than we've acknowledged and experienced in most churches in the United States. Still to this day, they say 11 o'clock 
is the most divided hour in the country. And it is, it is true. It is currently still true for our church, though we're making active steps to be more diverse and to move purposely in race, race relations. It's still divided. So we, we've got to do better. We've got to do more. We live uh, in Chesapeake and in our neighborhood and in South Norfolk where we are. There are lots of people that look different than most of us in the room. So that they're there. We just haven't done the best job of making them want to know about God or us. We've still constructed this you do you, what do you, separate but equal kind of mentality for the church. And uh, it's not what the kingdom of God looks like. So I'm going to ask uh, David, we're going to watch a video, and then Brian is going to come, and we're going to worship, because that is our first step in saying, Thy kingdom come, is to worship the Lord together. Somewhere out there, a little brown boy has been convinced that all brown boys should be good at basketball, and he can't understand why he isn't. Somewhere out there, a little white girl has been told that white people can't dance, as if their bodies are somehow incapable of responding to music. Somewhere, an Asian student isn't making straight A's. A Muslim student isn't making bombs. Today, a woman was told that her shape was more important than her name. Somewhere, a white man will tell his white kids not to trust those black kids and the shade of hoodlum that they will eventually become. Truth is, somewhere they've lied to us. Truth is, there are no stereotypes nor colors on our souls, no pigments that have seeped deep enough to breathe the depths of our hearts, for we were all born from the same shade of love. So, would you make us after your own image? Would you, God, orchestrate this symphony of melanin to sing the beauty of your face? May our faces be like music. May our colors compose a song that reflects every genre of your love, blending each of these skin tones into a melody too beautiful for one heart to sing. Form a choir from the souls you've acquired from the grave that we might sing your name and spring forth back into life as vibrant as the promise of your rainbow. For you have paid the price for every nation and tongue. Who am I to segregate your treasure? Let it be so that when the rooster Jim crows, we deny the Christ who was called all sheep back into his fold, but instead give sight to these colorblind eyes and make a home out of our lives. I pray for the rhythm of your heartbeat quakes the very landscape of my world. You into loving those around me. Permit us to see just as you see that you are always one, yet always three. So we were always made in the very image of community and called to worship as such. Just as the morning sun peeled back the night sky, you undressed the flesh off of your soul to present your spirit holy to us that we might find rest in these blankets of skin you have chosen to wrap us in may we worship like the breaking of a new day pulling back these sheets and unwrapping our hearts like a present to present them in the presence of our king may we not be foolish enough to think that we can confine your light to one church or limit your glory in just one building or contain your grace to one race or denomination but may our praises be in both spirit and in truth for our hearts can only beat so fast these words can only say so much and the riches of my gaze often falls chief on your glory these hands these hands can only reach so far Flesh can never give you what you fully deserve, so this skin alone will always limit your worth. So may we not let skin hinder our worship, but paint your name on the altar of our lips. Stain our words with the color of your glory, so that whenever we speak about our races, we acknowledge that you are the one that won them. But there are no colors on our souls, nothing here but your fingerprints, but you hold our lives. And the very hand that shaped the world, so may everything that has breath praise your grip. For you have multiplied your descendants as numerous as the stars that our song crescendo with all of creation as we sing praises to you our father the god of all the universe and every color it has to offer since the beginning you have carved a new song into the heart of every bird and they're all different it's as if you frown on division but give flight to diversity i pray i pray that our love grows wings takes flight in our communities and soars straight towards you that you might take joy in our worship but our song will be the soundtrack to you moving here among us for we are yours god the medley of your image, living by your scripts, living out our differences and worshiping together until we are all together as one. One in the very spirit of you.
reconciliation. If you have a question for the panel discussion next week, there's a box back there that you can fill it out. We would love to hear your questions around intentional unity.